Well, um, 1 John 1, Matthew 5, if you don't have a Bible, there should be one underneath the seat in front of you. I, I would just want to encourage you to just um, get acquainted with holding a Bible in your hand. And uh, um, I, I know we have devices. I know we, we put the, the, the Scripture up on the screen. Uh, but I would just encourage you to get used to having the Scripture and navigating the Scriptures for yourself. And one just kind of a simple way to do that is right here when we're gathered, we provide Bibles for you. And if you don't have a Bible, take that. That's our gift to you. That just, that's yours. Um, but uh, we want to, this is God's word to us. We believe it. Uh, we believe that this is what, this is God's good news uh, to, to humanity, and we want to be all about it. And so, well, we're in, and so in if Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is introducing, this is the introduction to his, Jesus' most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. And although this is likely his, it, it is his most famous sermon, it is um, the certainly the least obeyed sermon that Jesus gave um, because it's just crazy. It's backward. It, it doesn't fit in with the way that we think. Um, Jesus takes everything that we know to be right and good and true and all of that, and he flips it upside down. And later on in the sermon, Jesus is going to say, uh, you, you got to hear this. He says this. In, later in this sermon, he's kind of closing out this sermon. Here's what he says in Matthew 7. He says, enter by the narrow gate. And he's going to explain what that is. He says, for by the gate, for, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Jesus is going, he's wrapping up this sermon. He's going, look, I know I just laid out something for you that is incredibly hard. It is not the way in which you, are, way in which you think. That you look around the world and you, you see, you, you, look at, you look at the way things go in this world and you're going, okay, what's going to bring me my joy? What's going to bring me my happiness? What's going to bring me my fulfillment? And so this is what we do. This is what most people do. Like mo not, not just, and I'm not just saying most people out there. I'm saying most people. People, all right? Most people, what we do is we, we, we look around and we chase after what it is that we think is going to bring me the most fulfillment, the most, whether that be money, status, relationship, family, whatever it is. And in the end, they may have experienced some good moments, may have had some good times, but Jesus says that it only leads to their destruction and eternal separation from God. And Jesus is going, I know, I know this is not the way you think. I know this is, not the way, this is not the way you're wired to think here in, in, in the kingdom of this world, here in America. But Jesus says, and yet there are only a few people who look beyond what they can see here. They look beyond all the stuff, all the things that you could chase after here to try to fulfill yourself. There's a few people, a few, that are on a narrow, narrow road that look to God alone for their purpose, for their meaning, for their joy, for their satisfaction, for their fulfillment. And because that life, that life that it so conflicts with what most people count as a worthy life, to, to, to say, no, I, just forget all that stuff. I don't need that stuff. I don't need a bigger, better, newer, nicer. I don't need any of that. I don't need, my joy, my hope, my satisfaction is found in God alone. And, and the world looks at that, the kingdom of this world looks at those people, those few people, and looks at them and says, you are a loser. And yet Jesus says in the end, but theirs is the life that will go on forever in the new heaven, in the new earth. And you hear that, and, and you go, so, so then how do I know that I'm on, like, on the narrow way? How do I know that's me? Like, how do I know I'm not just part of the many in, in the easy way? Like, how do I know that that's just, because the truth of the matter is that there are many, and like Jesus goes on in, in just a few verses after he makes a statement, he says, let me just clarify it a little bit more. He says, there's going to be many that come to me that have a religious church kind of vernacular. They understand, they have, they've got, they've been accustomed to some religious routine, some church routine, and they're going to know like what to say on that day. Like when they meet me, when they stand before me as their judge. And they're going to say, he says, they're going to be some that come to me and say, Lord, Lord, because isn't that what we do? Lord this, Lord that, Lord. Uh, he's going to come, he's, Lord, Lord, didn't I do this? Didn't I do this? Didn't I go here? And, did, and didn't I do all these things? And he's going to say, and I'm going to look at them and go, no, 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 you were part of the many. 
That you tried to straddle the fence here. You tried to like on a Sunday, you're like, oh yeah, I'm all in and I got the, I got the, and then, but through your life, your life proved to be that, you know, you were after this. You were all about all of this. What can you get out of the world? You weren't, you, you, your joy wasn't wrapped up in, in me. Your joy was wrapped up in, could you get this? Could you fulfill this? Could you? And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. So we hear this. We're going, how, listen, then how do I, golly, how do I get in? How do I know? How do I know I'm not on the road to hell and I'm on the road to heaven? And Jesus says it. he opens this sermon by saying, what well, begins by having poverty of spirit, being poor of spirit, Poor in spirit. In other words, having eternal life is more than just agreeing to a set of things. Like, okay, yeah, you tell me, tell me what to believe. Okay, yeah, I agree to that right on. Or, or, or agreeing to a, cer- a certain set of teachings. But if you believe it, if you believe it, and it, it gets past beyond do you know it. It gets past beyond can you teach it. It gets past this whole do you have the language that when somebody brings up something, you know exactly what to say, and you know what we're supposed to say, and you know when we stand up and sit down in church, and you know, when, you know what to say in Bible study, and you know how to do all these things, and you know, how to, you know how to get around it, navigate your way around spiritual conversation. No, no, no. He's going, but it gets down in the way that if you believe this, it gets down into the way that you live, not just the way that you talk, not just how, what you know. It gets into the way that you live. It changes you by changing what you want to do. It changes what you consider to be a happy life. It it changes what you consider. If you believe this to be true, then it changes what you consider to be, what Jesus says, is a blessed life. I mean, you read what Jesus says here, though. I mean, mean, we just heard it read. You know, all these blessed statements. Like, okay, let's just be real. Who wants to be poor? Like, who wants to be in mourning? Who wants to be rejected? Like, how is that going to bring me blessing? How is that going to bring happiness? So here it is. That through all of this, because through all of that, through poverty, through mourning, through rejection, through persecution, through hunger, in all of it, God is going to be everything to you. He's going to be everything to you. Because when things are going well for you and when things are going, you're completely satisfied by you know, your awesome life, then let me ask you, when that happens, and listen, we've had seasons, you've had seasons, even if, even if you've had a rough go of it lately, you'd, you know, you've had a season, at least a season or a moment in your life where you're like, okay, things seem to be okay now, seem to, seem, seem to be pretty smooth. Listen, in those moments, when do you lean in on God? When everything's cool. When everything's the way that I want it to go, when my life is going smooth, like where, are, where in that do you lean in? When do you cling to God, go after God? When do you discover in your awesome life that he is everything that you need, that he is the one who actually brings ultimate and eternal fulfillment and satisfaction? And so Jesus pulls back the curtain and says, but where there is poverty and where there is sorrow, and where there is persecution, where you come to the end of yourself, that's where you run to him. That's where you go to him. That, that's where you find that God is everything to you. And that, Jesus says, is where blessing is found. So you may have heard of, of the Apostle Paul. We talk a lot about him here. I mean, he wrote like most of the New Testament. Um, a, an apostle of, of Jesus and saw Jesus uh, in, 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 like in person and, and, uh, and then went around the world telling the, telling the world about the gospel, uh, about the good news of Jesus. Paul, in all that he did, in all, in all of his life, he says, every once in a while he comes across, he'll come across Paul going, I've got this thorn in my flesh. I've got this thorn in my flesh, and I've asked God to take it away, but he won't take it away. And we don't know what that is. We have no idea. what. We don't know if it's like a physical ailment. We don't know if it's like a relational type thing. We, we don't know what's going on here. But there's something that Paul is like, I don't want this. I'm living this, and this is a, re, this is a current reality in my life, and I don't want it. I've asked God, he says, he says in, his, in, 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 in one of his letters, he says, I'm ask, I've asked God to take it. God, take it. Why haven't you taken it? And God said to Paul, because my power is revealed not in your strength, not in your prosperity, Paul. My power is revealed in your weakness. When you are weak, that's when people know where I am. That's when people know that I've shown up. Where you're weak in your weakness, my strength can now be made known. 
And that's what this is all about, that the world would see, the, see God for who he is. They would see God, that they would feel God. So when things don't go well for you, and, and yet you rejoice, when life is falling apart, and yet you rejoice and you follow God anyways, people around you are going, what kind of joy is this? I mean, what kind of world are you living in? This is new. This is different. This is weird. This isn't the way things go. We, like, when things are up, we're up. When things are down, we're down. But things are, like, down and you're up. So what's up? Like, like, how is this possible? How are you doing this? What is this? And you're going, yeah, you're right. But I can rejoice in sorrow and rejection because I belong to a kingdom that is not like this. I belong to the kingdom of heaven. That there's something greater that I have found that brings fulfillment and peace and joy, even when things don't seem to be going my way. But if all you do is walk through life and everything is just working, then the world will never see that God is all sufficient. If you just go through life and everything just seeing, everything's just going well, God, the world will never see that God is all glorious. They never see God. They just look at your awesome life and go, well, of course you're happy. Everything in your life is working. Or even if, you're ha- if you have this awesome life and you're going, uh, well, you know, God be the glory, right? I'm ha- blessed. Just blessed. I got, I got everything. I got this, this, you know, this, this new thing, this nice thing. I got these, you know, this family and these kids and everything's going well. And they got into this school and man, I just ha- you know, blessed. I'm just blessed. Listen, even if you do that and you're like, I'm bringing glory to God. People may turn to God, but it's not because they're turning to God. It's because they want your awesome life. And if that's what it takes, if, God, if turning to God means they can have that life, then give me some of God. But what they want in the end is not God. They want whatever it is they're looking for in this world. And so Jesus says, it's when you come, it comes, you come to the end of yourself that God becomes everything to you. And that's when the world sees who God is through your life. So Jesus begins with, in chapter 5, verse 3, it begins with, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed or happy are those who understand that spiritually they bring nothing to the table, that they are bankrupt, that they, they are in desperate need of help. Blessed are the ones who are not self, so self-righteous that they don't need God. Blessed are the ones who understand that they own nothing, that they have nothing that was not given to them by God. It's the ones who have an accurate understanding of who God is and an accurate understanding of who they are. Because when the truth of who I am intersects with the truth of who God is, then I realize that I have nothing. When I see God for who he really is, then all of a sudden I get a, very, a clear picture of who I am and I realize that I am bankrupt, that I have nothing that I need him for everything, but it gets worse than that. When I see God for who he is, for his, his holiness, his goodness, his righteousness, when I see God for who he is, then all of a sudden I, I encounter that. I don't care what my moral resume is here on this earth. I realize one thing is for sure, that I am a sinner. When I see him, when, when the truth of God intersects with the truth of who I am, I realize that I'm a sinner. And the, the, the Apostle John, he was, uh, he was a guy that, that, um, that, that, Jesus loved dearly. In fact, Jesus was on the cross, and he tells John, says, John, here's my mom. You take care, you take care of her. You, like, this is, the, this is the relationship that John had with Jesus. J- John refer, liked to or affectionately refer to himself as the apostle that Jesus loved, all right? I don't know how the other apostles felt about that, but, but this, is, this is a relationship that John had. He was tight with Jesus. And, uh, and so Jesus, or John writes a gospel about the life of Jesus, and he writes some letters to say, this is, this is what we've heard, of Je- what we heard from Jesus, how he taught, and what we know about God. And so this is, I want you to know. And so in 1 John chapter 1, he writes down some things, and he, and he uses this language, and, and, and he's talking about um, what happens when God collides with man. What happens when the reality of God and the reality of man kind of come together? And here's how he talks about it. He talks about it in terms of light and darkness. Light and darkness. What happens when the light meets the darkness? What happens in that moment? So in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, this is what he says. This is what John says. This is the message that we heard from him. We heard from Jesus. And we proclaim to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Now, here's the thing about, here's the thing about light. It, it exposes what's in the dark, right? Like you turn the light on, you see what was in the dark. 
several years ago, uh, my first trip to to Russia. I, I, it was somewhere in the mid '90s. I, I was 15. Um, I turned 16 there in uh, in, in Russia, and um, we were. Uh, it was it was just a few years after Russia had come out of how, come out of communism, so they were still very much in kind of feeling that oppression. And uh, it was literally, it was like going back up 50 years, 100 years. It was like going back in time. It was crazy. But uh, on that trip, my first trip overseas, my first trip, my first, you know, it was just all very new to me. And we had a 27-hour train ride in Russia. And, uh, and that's just like when you're in Russia on a train ride, like back then, that, that's not a good day. Like, that's not, that's not fun. That's not enjoyable. That's not vacation. And uh, I remember getting on this train, and I'd heard my dad talk about this because he had already, he had already experienced it before I got there. And, and, uh, and, like, you would walk in the aisle, like, walk out of your room and into the hallway, and, and there were, like, where the restroom was, there would just be stuff. Like, if the, if the train was kind of, like, leaning this way, like, stuff would just fly, you know, like, kind of roll out from underneath the door, and you're just kind of walking, you know, like this everywhere. And... Uh, and, but I remember, I remember my dad talking about this and then, and then experiencing this. He said, you know, uh, when, you, when you would go into your room, in your cabin, you turn on the light. When you turn on the light, you would immediately see all these roaches just, just go. Like hide, like underneath places. Go underneath your pillow, underneath the mattress. Like they're just, they just take off. And uh, it's like the light comes on and then you see what was going on in here. This is what happens, right? God, it, the, the light exposes the darkness. And so when I examine my life in light of him, he is the light, he is the light, there is no darkness in him whatsoever. When I examine my life in, light, in my life in light of him, the darkness in me is exposed. The, the darkness in me, I realize that there are things about me that are not true about, about God. There, there are things that are not true about God that are true of me. Like, like God doesn't lie, I lie. That he, that he doesn't gossip, I gossip. That he has self-control. I don't have self-control. My sin is exposed when the light meets the darkness. So then what do I do with it? What, what do I do with the sin that has been brought to light? Like, how, What's my response then to be when God, the light of God, exposes the darkness of Stephen? How should I respond? What, what is good and right? Well, John tells us in his letter of three ways, that we, the three wrong responses in that moment. That when you, are, when you are exposed, when your sin is exposed, when, you're, when the light is cast upon your life and the sin is exposed, like John's going, there's three ways in which you do not respond. You should not respond in that moment. And the first one, he tells us in verse 6, he says, If we say we have fellowship with him, with God, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. In other words, John is saying this, that the first wrong response to have when you are confronted with your sin, when your sin or the light shines on your life, the first wrong response is to say, I have unrepentant sin. I have unrepentant sin. I have sin that I'm pursuing. I know it's sin, but I'm going after it. There, I, have, I, have unpre- I have unrepentant sin, but hey, it's okay. I'm a Christian. I have unrepentant sin, but, but it's all right. I, I'm, I'm a Christian. This is the one who attends church, but outside of church, outside of the gathering, you have no real relationship with Jesus, that you say you're a Christian, and so you, 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 you pursue this sin in your life, you pursue like I'm, I'm going after it, uh, but, but yet you're saying that, no, but I'm a, it's all right, I'm a Christian, and, and, and do you hear what John just called you? That if you're in here today, you're going, no, 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 I'm a Christian. But yeah, I know there are some things that I'm pursuing that are not, that, are, that, that is sinful. That I'm, but I, I have every intention of walking out of here. And this week it's going to be, John just said, you're a liar. That there is no such thing as a Christian who consistently pursues sin. That's just not a thing. Now listen, he's not talking about the person who you know, who fights sin and gives into temptation or is imperfect. He's going to tell us in a moment that we're all sinners. But he's talking about the one who is willfully, defiantly pursuing sin. That to say you're a Christian, John is saying, to say that you're a Christian and pursue sin, defiantly, willfully pursue sin, to say you're a Christian is a joke. And God is not fooled. 
It's the, it's the ones who say, you know, we're, we're living together and we're not married. And, and yeah, I, I, know it's, I know it's wrong, but hey, hey, but we're still Christians. The one who cheats on their taxes and says, you know, nobody's perfect. It's the college guy who gets drunk and sleeps with his girlfriend and yet say, I, I know, I know it's wrong. I know, I know, but I, I'm still a Christian. It's essentially saying, I've accepted Jesus as my Savior, but not as my Lord. As if Jesus is like some salad bar that you can choose the parts that you want and leave the parts you don't. Listen, if you have no intention of submitting your life to Christ, but want to believe that you're a Christian because when you were seven in Sunday school, someone told you that you were going to go to hell if you didn't pray a prayer, then you are deceived. If you have no intention of submitting your life to Jesus Christ, but somehow think that your attendance here is earning you favor with God, you are lying to yourself and you're trying to make a liar out of God. So the first response to the sin that Jesus refutes, or that John refutes, is that I have unrepentant sin, but it's okay. I'm a fornicator, I'm a gossip, I'm an adulterer, I'm arrogant, but it's okay. I'm a Christian. John says, that's not even possible. You are deceived. I don't care what prayer you prayed. You cannot be saved by the light when you hate the light. Well, here's another response that John says is the wrong response when being confronted with your sin. It's in verse eight. He says, if we say we have no sin, We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. This is the person who says, yeah, I used to sin a lot. But now I'm a Christian and I just don't sin anymore. I I used to. I mean, yeah, there was a a season in my life. Yeah, it was rough. I mean, like back in 96, let me tell you what was going on. But I'm past that. I don't do that anymore. That's, that's, just not, that's just not me anymore. So John is saying that if you believe that you have no sin that needs to be confessed, that other people have sinned, but you don't have sin that needs to be confessed, or you say that you're a sinner, but you can't really point to anything specific in your life, then John is saying that you're deceived. That you have a lofty view of yourself that just is not a reality. Listen, at any point in your Christian life, in, in, in your then you're following Jesus at any point in your life, you should be able to uh, approach somebody and ask them, hey, what is, what is the temptation that you're being tempted with now? And what, are, what have you been giving into? Like, what have you given into, to, 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 into temptation? Like, what is, what is the fight now? What is the, what is the struggle that you have? You should be able to ask anybody that. And they should be able to ask you, ask you and whoever you ask should be able to immediately point to, well, let me tell you. Let me tell you what's going on. Let me tell you how what, the, the sin that I'm fighting. The, let me tell you what, what the struggle is right now. But man, I don't know if you've dealt with this, but, but how irritating is it to talk to someone who thinks that they don't have any sin? And you ask them, say, hey, well, man, what, what are you struggling with now? Like, what's, what's the fight? What are you struggling with now? And they look at you and go, well, sometimes I just feel like I care too much about people. And it's, you know, I, just, I give so much of my money away that I don't have enough money for my, you know, my own needs. And they asked me, well, what about you? What are you struggling? I'm like, well, on the way over here, some guy cut me off and I felt like pulling him out of his car and stomping on his face. But I don't really feel like telling you that right now, right? Like, <laughs> Listen, the reality is that just because you become a Christian doesn't mean that you're done sinning. You're still going to be wrestling with sin because your flesh is alive and well and it wars against you. If we claim to be without sin, he says, then we have been deceived. That our enemy, who the Bible calls the deceiver, has deceived us. And what's more, we begin to deceive ourselves, thinking that we're better than what we really are. We're lying to ourselves and we're lying to God. So the first response, the first wrong response to sin is I'm a Christian, so it's okay. Or the second response that is wrong when it comes to being confronted with your sin is, well, I'm a Christian who used to sin, but I don't sin anymore. And then the third response is in verse 10. And he says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. We make God a liar, and his word is not in us. This is the person who says, I have never sinned. I've never sinned. Okay, so I'm not sure that there's anybody in this room who would just openly say, 
I've never sinned, right? I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident that no one's going no to make that claim. But I think this might have more to do with us, with us than what we might think. This is the person who says, hey, look, I'm a good person. I'm a moral person. I'm a good Christian. So here's what typically happens. What, we, what typically happens when, we, when our response, when we fall into the category, I've never sinned, is that we're somebody who likes to rank sin. We like to compare ourselves to others and rank sin. So we'll look at certain sin as the big sin that God get, really gets upset about. But then there's all that other little stuff that maybe I might, you know, that's a, you know, in my life that God doesn't care so much because he's so concerned about this over here. He's not really all that concerned about this over here. He's kind of okay with it. And that's because we grew up in churches that didn't teach us to live in the gospel, but instead the Christian life was essentially about morality. It's all about just being a moral person, just building up your moral resume. Just don't get drunk. Don't sleep with people who are not your spouse. Try to watch your mouth as best as you can and don't watch rated R movies. And so now you can pat yourself on the back and go, see, I'm not so bad. Like, I'm, I'm, I don't need to repent. I'm a good man. I, I love my wife well. I, I love my kids. I tie. They go to church every Sunday. I don't do any of that other stuff that those heathens do. And then there's this weird sense that you have inside of you that you, you don't need to look into your heart anymore like the fact that you're embarrassed to talk about Jesus, like that's not even, like that's not a sin. The Bible says that you're deceived. And it probably explains why your faith has just become this cold, stale routine. And because you think that you're okay, you never feel like confession and repentance is necessary. Listen, the clearest sign that you are growing closer to God is not that you stop sinning but that you become more and more aware of sin that's in your heart. Because as I grow in understanding of, of who God is, and I grow in my understanding of how holy he is, and then I become more and more aware of how grievous my sin is. So then the response isn't to cover it up, it's not to justify it, it's not to, to you know, blame somebody else about it, but it's to just agree with God about it. That's what confession is. It's just, I agree with God, you call it sin, and so I agree with you on this. It is sin. And Jesus says, and for the one who longs for God, the one who is on the narrow road to life, the response when you're confronted with your sin will be to mourn your sin. I'm not going to justify it. I'm not going to blame somebody. I'm not going to diminish how, how serious it is, I'm going to mourn it. I'm going to call it what it is. I'm going to mourn my sin. This is what he says in, in verse 4. He said, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed those are those who mourn. Jesus here is talking about a spiritual mourning. You, you see your sin for what it is. You see your, the, the reality of your sin, how I have turned my back on God. I've rebelled against God's good design for my life, how I have fallen short of his glory and his good calling on my life. And you mourn your sin. Now, I realize that this may sound a bit strange. You're like, what in the world is this? Like, what? In, like, what? So what, what exactly is this all about? Well, first I would say this, that Jesus is not talking about when he says, to, when he says blessed are those who mourn. He's not talking about a, 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 a mourning that, it, that is over a general category of sin, where you just become so overwhelmed with how, how much of a failure you are that it just leaves you in despair. Listen, in the scripture, Satan is called the accuser. Here, here's what this means, that Satan knows the religious game. He knows the church game. He knows how this thing goes. And so he'll come to Christians and he'll go, look, you read the Bible and you look at your life, you are, you are like you're nowhere near this. Like, look at you. Look what a failure you are. Like, this, this is what Satan does. This is, this is how he comes to us as the accuser. That, that you are a, look, look, you have fallen into this and you'll never, like this is it's just who you are. You have no place to go with this. You're just a failure. You're, you're just in utter hopelessness. This is what he does. He comes to us with shame and guilt to put you in a place of hopelessness. But let me be clear about something. That when Jesus talks about mourning here, he isn't talking about falling into a place of shame and despair. Look, it's, it's, understand that it's the Holy Spirit 
who is the one who is revealing these things in our life. It is the Holy Spirit who is bringing our sin to bear here. He is, he is, he is letting us, allowing us to see what has been in the dark. That when we, the light of God is shining upon our life and it is the Holy Spirit's going, look right here. Like that's what's happening. It's, it's, it's called conviction. When the Holy Spirit convicts us. So when the Holy Spirit brings these things to the surface in your heart, he exposes what's in the dark, the Holy Spirit will never lead you into shame and despair. He is not bringing these things up, saying, look at this, to lead you into a place of shame and despair. He always leads you into something better than where you are. The conviction of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit bringing your sin to the surface is, listen, it is not to tell you, to show you how hopeless you are. It is an invitation to go into the life that Jesus bought for you. It's an invitation into the life that Jesus calls the blessed life. This is what the Holy Spirit is doing. When, there, when, there, when you feel conviction of sin, it's not like he's just trying to pound you with it. He's going, no, 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 see it. Confess it so you can live in a, I'm inviting you into a better life. So mourning your sin isn't about wallowing in your shame and regret and guilt. No, it's recognizing that where you've been is no longer where you want to be. And what's more, understand that when you mourn your sin, it's, it's recognizing it's, it's particular sin. You're not just going, man, I've been such a failure lately. It is, no, no, where have you, where, what is the sin? Like, pull out the specific sin, the particular sin. Listen, there's no getting out of that sin unless you deal with that sin, unless you mourn that particular sin. And so then when the Holy Spirit brings that sin to your mind, to properly mourn our sin, I believe we've, we need to count the cost of that sin. So the Holy Spirit brings to mind like this, this thing right here. And it's not to condemn you, but it's just to free you. And so how do, we, how do we get to the place where Jesus is to mourn that sin? I think, I think part of that process is we've got to count the cost. What has that sin cost me? What has that sin cost others? How has that sin, how is that habit, how is that addiction, that attitude, that lust for pleasure, that lust for status, that lust for financial gain, that bitterness that you've held on to, how has that sin cost the people that you love? And where would you be in your relationship with God had you said no to that sin? Where would you be in your relationship with your husband, with your wife, with your mom, your dad, your son, your daughter, your friend, if you just said no to that sin? When mourning your sin, consider the cost of that sin. What has this cost, not just me, but what has this cost others around me? With me just selfishly pursuing what I want to pursue, how unknowingly, how has this cost the people around me? Now I, re I realize that you might be thinking, man, man, this just sounds awful. And maybe you came with a friend today, you're going, dude, why did you invite me to this place? What is going on? Where, like, where's the blessing in this? Where, where's the happy in this? Because this is what Jesus said, right? Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn. But check this. For they shall be comforted. For they shall be comforted. Jesus is going, you are blessed because you have a place to go with your mourning. You have a place to go with your sin. That you're not left in hopelessness. You're not left in despair. You have a place to go with this. So back to 1 John. In, in verse 9, listen to, what Paul, listen to what John says. He says, I love this. I, I, when I was a kid, this is one of the first verses I, I memorized, and thank God that it's kind of it's stayed with me. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins... What, so, again, what's confession? Well, it's, it's where we agree with God. Like, understanding that, uh, that when you open up the Bible, when you open up the Bible, that you don't come into the Bible as, like, the one in charge. Like, 
Like God is the umpire when you open the Bible, right? Like God is the one who calls balls and strikes when you open the Bible. Um, this, is, this, is his, this is his word. The, the, that God is the one who calls fornicators fornicators. He calls adulterers adulterers, gluttons gluttons, and sluggers sluggers. He calls sin what it is. He, just, he, doesn't, he doesn't leave that up to our interpretation. He calls it for what it is. Confession is where we agree with God. Walking in the light, God has revealed sin in us, and we come to God and we say, God, this is my sin. I name it what you name it, and I I call it what you call it. Confession, listen, is not where you just kind of let God in on what's going on like he doesn't know what's going on. That's not confession. Confession is, is not for God, it's for us. It's us agreeing with God. It's taking our sin out of the darkness and bringing it out into the light to say, here it is. James, the brother of Jesus, talks about confession. He says, you, can, you should confess your sins, yes, to God, and you should confess your sins also to one another. You should confess your sins to, your, to one another, to, to, to brothers and sisters, that I've been bitter against you. I've been downloading pornography. I've been gossiping on the phone. That we take our sin, we call it for what it is, we drag it into the light and say, I know, I know it's not pretty, but I'm supposed to walk in the light, and here it is. It's confession. You call it for what it is, and you bring it into the light. You don't try to make it sound better than what it is. You don't make excuses. You don't try to blame somebody else. You call your sin what it is, and when you do, it will cause you to mourn as you feel the weight of what you've done, and then God then can begin to do a change in you. He says if you confess your sins, he is faithful and he is just to cleanse you of all all unrighteousness, to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Listen, to those of you who are followers of Jesus, you have submitted your life to Jesus. He is the Lord, the King of your life. You belong to him. To those of you in the room that that is true of you, if you are a follower of Jesus, you understand that he is faithful, meaning that if you confess your sin, he will always hear you. He will always forgive you. He will always bring you back. He is faithful to you. That he's not going to hold out until you pay him back for what you've done. No, he is faithful and he is just to forgive you. Meaning that everything that was necessary for your forgiveness was accomplished when Jesus died on the cross. Because the justice of God, the goodness and the justice of God demanded there be payment for that sin. For your sin, for my sin. That there, and, and payment meant the, the loss of, like, you give your life. It demanded your life. Death must be the payment for sin. And in God's great mercy and his grace, God sent Jesus to die in your place. Meaning God's justice was met. A life was taken. Blood was shed. And it was Jesus. That if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive. But listen, if you are a person that never confesses your sin, if you're a person who never embraces the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're the person who is always making excuses to say, I'm not that bad, I'm not that bad, I'm not that bad, and you never confess your sin and embrace the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus, understand that you have nothing left from God in the end other than justice. that you will be judged for your own sin and you will be sentenced and you will be sent to hell and there will be torment forever because God is an eternal God and a sin against an eternal God is an eternal sin. And either the eternal God comes and pays for your sin or you will pay for it eternally. And so... I was just asking, where, where are you in this? Like, where do you land here? Like, have you gotten away from confessing your sin? The life of following Jesus in obedience in all things is going to repeatedly reveal in us where we need to confess and repent. Have you made a habit of this? Or are you good? 
Walking in the light means staying in tune with what's going on in your own heart. And let me just tell you, it's going to be uglier than what you think. But the more wicked we see our hearts, the more glorious we realize His grace really is. So are there some things that you just simply just don't want to do that you know God has called you to? Maybe it's loving your spouse in a particular way. Maybe that's loving your children in a particular way. Maybe it's serving somewhere. Maybe it's getting out of a certain relationship. Maybe it's going on a mission trip. Maybe it's being on mission where you're, where you're at, where you go to school, in that class, with that person, at that school, or at that, at that job. Maybe it's living a certain way with your money. But the fact that you are not doing those things, what does that say about the condition of your heart? Are you walking in the light? Is confession and repentance an ongoing part of your life? Or has all this just kind of become routine to you? Like where you just know, I know you, when you, we, we, it's Sunday we go and do and this and that and I've got this figured out and I know how, and, you, and it's just, it's just, kind of grown cold, and you've kind of grown cold to the Lord? Are you just pretending that there's nothing there to confess and repent? Is there, is there something in you, just your desires are so far outweigh, like you're, you're letting the, the lust of your life, your lust of your eyes, lust of your flesh, to, to, to just kind of drown out any conviction that the Holy Spirit is trying to, to bring to you, to lead you into a life of joy, into a place of life? Listen, if you are pretending, it's time to confess and repent. And he is faithful. If you confess, he'll forgive you. He is also just. Because if you don't, the Bible tells us that it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Some of you are playing games with God. You read silly little books and you come up with silly little ideas that he's different than what he truly is, that somehow he's just looking at your sin, he's just kind of winking at your sin. And Let me tell you this. If God has the courage to send his son to pay with his life for the sin that he did not commit, then he is the righteous judge who will see to it that sinners who never trust in Jesus will pay for their own sin with their own life. And he will not wink because he is not like us. He is just. And he truly is good. But he is faithful to forgive those who confess and repent. This week, there was a guy in our church, a brother, who was sharing with me some of his story. And some things that they weren't just, they're not just kind of like way in the past. These are like pretty fresh in, in his life, in his family's life. And, and he talked about how several years ago, though, he had become addicted to alcohol, which became his only priority in life, that everything kind of revolved around alcohol in his life, which led him to further and further sin and selfishness, and including betraying his wife. By God's grace, God woke him up to his sin and showed him this is the trajectory of your life. Like he didn't need, he didn't, like God didn't owe him that, but by God's grace, he, there was a moment he realized, if I keep going down this path, this is where it's going. This is where this is leading me, and I was going to be destroyed. And so, in doing so, in, in realizing that how to, like, the other way to get out of that, to get out of this, he realized that there were some things that he was going to have to confess and have to confront. And so in his story that he shared with me, in part of his story, he shares this struggle that he had in, like, trying to, like, realizing, like, that I've been confronted with sin, now what do I do? But I don't necessarily want to confess certain things. And so he shared that struggle, and I'll just read that to you. Here's what he said. He said, I knew deep down that in my failure to confess my, hid, my hidden sin to my wife, I was disobeying God, though I denied it to myself every day. 
I attempted to grow closer to God any way that I could through prayer, church, and other sermons, but they all pointed me to confession and living in the light without hidden sin. I dug through the Bible looking for an excuse to not have to confess, thinking that if I didn't find the verse that said, thou shalt confess to your wife that I was off the hook, lying to myself the whole time. But that verse doesn't exist. With my hidden sin in the dark, I had my family, I had a good job, I had an esteemed reputation as a veteran. According to our America, I had it all, but I was still running or maybe even hiding from God. God never stopped calling me. He surrounded me with conviction, and my heart was softened. I finally listened. I realized that all I had was nothing because I had turned my back on God. Eventually, I stopped lying to myself. I didn't deserve any of it, but Jesus met me in my self-created valley of the shadow of death and walked with me through it. It is totally by God's grace that I broke up with alcohol. Despite the expectation that my wife would leave me and take our daughter with her, I confessed to my wife because even having a family but not having God is worthless. God freed me from so many idols, alcohol, grief, selfishness, hidden sin, even my wife and kid I had put before God. By God's grace, I'm free. I don't know about you, but when I read through this, The phrase that stood out to me is that even having a family, which the American dream, that's it, right? You get the family, you get the wife, you get the kids, you got the, you know, you're you're, you're set. This is where it starts. Even having a family but not having God is worthless. By God's grace, I'm free. Because the source of our unhappiness at its deepest level is not because life is working out. The source of our unhappiness at its root level is alienation from God. Is not knowing God. And this is what I hope for us during this season is as Jesus is laying out these things to say, hey, this is the person who is blessed because this is the person comes to the end of themselves, and when you come to the end of yourself, you know God. And so Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And in being comforted, they will know the comforter.